All right, welcome back to another episode of Two Plain Sports. Just the Jose and Brandon show today. Brum had a work emergency. The Celtics are getting their ass kicked, so yeah. he's scared to, to, to talk to us right now. Yeah, that's what we suspect. But <clears throat> So he's going to be missing today's show. Don't worry, he'll be back on Friday. Well, today, the Celtics are getting their ass kicked on Thursday. Yeah, unless there's another work <laughs> emergency that comes up, he will be back Friday. Uh, today we're going to talk about Jordan Tyson. Picked Arizona State over Oklahoma. A lot of people thought it was OU all the way there. Clearly, that did not come to fruition. Some official visitors are starting to, or some recruits are starting to announce that they're taking official visits and where they're taking them to. So we'll talk about a couple of those. And then we'll, we're just going to do a little bit of a projected defensive side of the ball starting lineup. Um, we were kind of going through it beforehand, and we've talked about the defense a lot over the last few months because that is definitely the biggest pain for this team but there there's it's definitely not going to be an instant fix i think in the this next football season but we'll talk about that towards the end don't forget to like comment subscribe share the video follow us on twitter instagram tiktok if that's your thing if you prefer audio we're on spotify and apple Podcasts. so go look us up there and rate the show if you wouldn't mind. Let's get started. All right, so Jordan Tyson, wide receiver, transfer from Colorado, picks Arizona State over Oklahoma. Definitely more of a surprise, probably a surprise to a lot of people. He was on campus two weeks ago, two weekends ago, has a connection with Mike Hawkins. They were out teammates to Allen, but Arizona State came out on top. Rashad Samples won a battle over OU here. A guy that Oklahoma really wanted when they were first looking for their wide receivers coach. Brandon, what do you think about about the move for Tyson? Does it how does it affect Oklahoma, if any at all? What are your thoughts here? Uh, bummed when when I first saw it on Twitter because I was one of the ones who was pretty excited about Jordan Tyson. The possibility the dude put up almost 500 yards on 21 catches last year, so he averaged like 21 yards a catch, which is my favorite stat. Um, you know, he's a burner. He showed he played really well against a very good Oregon team last year. Uh, I, I was excited about the possibility. I was probably one of the people who thought he was coming to Oklahoma. Uh, so I was a little bit caught off guard. It, it I kind of go back to when we were talking about Troy Everett, when he was deciding between a seemingly Oklahoma and, and Virginia Tech, how we talked about it's tough to convince a kid to come to Oklahoma when he might not play right away. When, you know, it's with Troy Everett, the, the thought was that at Vautech, he might play day one. Um, where at, at OU, he's probably going to sit for a year, most likely, um, and then maybe have his chance next season. Maybe with Jordan Tyson, it was that. Because Arizona State, at the end of the day, um, they're not they're not a great football team. I, I don't know their whole roster, their whole depth chart. I know Chad Johnson's son plays at Arizona State, which is pretty cool uh, at receiver. But I... Outside of him, and I only know him because he's Chad Johnson's son, I don't know anybody on, in that receiver room. I don't know anybody, you know, who, who's returning, who's transferred in, what kind of recruits they got, uh, anything about Arizona uh, anything about Arizona State's receiving core. So I feel like with Tyson, maybe this is just a situation where he, you know, looked at both schools, weighed all of his options, and decided for his football career, he's going to be able to maybe see the field right away at Arizona State. Tempe is, is at the end of the day, an awesome place to be. Uh, great campus, maybe just the the atmosphere of Arizona State and the ability to play maybe right away is something that was um, more enticing to him than coming to Oklahoma and maybe not having that opportunity to see the field right away. Yeah, I think those are fair assessments there. And for Arizona State, that's a, a weapon that definitely helps them out in trying to not suck again last year they were three and nine so not a great season but they also have a brand new head coach in kenny dillingham who when he first got hired to arizona state he had his opening press conference and dude started crying he is from arizona he's like really passionate about arizona state football who so that's definitely a guy that if he is any good at coaching he's going to give it his all for this program Jordan Tyson prob- also could probably want to be playing for an offensive-minded head coach. It's not like Oregon's offenses were pretty good when when Kenny was there as the OC. How he can translate it now that he's a head coach, who knows how quickly they'll turn around. They did get uh, Jaden Rashada 
um, after he got his release from Florida and the that whole debacle where NIL wasn't completely uh, taken care of from Florida's part, it seems like, and Jaden got to go to Arizona State, which might be a better situation. Who knows? At the end of the day, I do agree with the, like the, the college life, definitely going to be different than what would have been in Norman. A lot more of a city atmosphere. Campus is <clears throat> really close to Scottsdale. So it's not it's not like it's a bad place to go to school. He'll have a lot of fun, and who knows, maybe he'll be part of the, the turnaround of the Sun Devils. We'll see how long if that if that does happen. But they didn't comp- some of the games that they played last year. They were in for a little bit. Like they weren't just laying down and letting people run over them. They they actually gave USC a little bit of competition there until about the fourth quarter. Then Caleb Williams kind of did what he does and just torched them for the rest of the fourth quarter and made it look not competitive. At the end of the day, I think Oklahoma is going to be fine. I think that kind of transitioned transitions us to the wide receiver room oklahoma's been looking at a lot of wide receivers recently in the portal um, they've added talent through recruiting in the high school ranks do you think this affects the wide receiver room at all like does it really did it really matter or impact a lot if jordan tyson would have added been added to the room i think jordan tyson could have put up similar numbers to what he did at um uh, Colorado, if he would have came to Oklahoma this year, I, you know, I don't think he would have been the every snap receiver, but just his big playability, his speed, I think would have put him on the field to make some plays. So that I think stings maybe a little bit, but you know, you look at Brennan Thompson, I think they have very similar games. Um, I think Brennan Thompson's going to have a role similar to that. I could see him finishing 25, 30 catches uh, for 400 yards through three or four touchdowns. I think, I think Brennan Thompson will do what Jordan Tyson may have done. Uh, in this offense, I think Jordan Tyson is a slightly better player. Uh, so I think Tyson would have probably beat out Brennan Thompson for a role like that. But at the end of the day, we have Brennan Thompson now. I think Brennan Thompson's capable. Uh, he's obviously a burner. So I think he'll he'll be fine. Uh, the, the receiver room as a whole will still be fine. Um, it's just, it is what it is. Yeah, Tyson really just brought the experience. But now that he's confirmed not to be a Sooner, it's time for Brennan Thompson and the young guys to step up. Because someone's got to take that spot. Like You have no more Marvin Mims. Everyone expects Jalil to be the guy now. He had a good year, not an amazing year last year. So can he take that next jump to be really good? We'll see, I guess. Um, next part here. Nope. Oh, yeah, Jaquez. He, he has an opportunity now as well, like you mentioned. So a lot of uh, to be determined there in the wide receiver room, it seems like. But they'll, they'll feel the team. And they've got two really reliable, at least reliable receivers with Jalil and Drake Stoops. They just need someone to be the, for sure, number one. So that they can kind of mold the offense around what the skill set that they have. Still think that's got to be Jalil Farouk. He's got to take a big jump. He's got to. I agree. <clears throat> if not, he might be around for one more year, which wouldn't be the worst thing. Because Oklahoma yeah. would definitely need that going into jackson arnold's first year right now it doesn't look like there's a clear-cut guy for him once he takes over the the reins qb1 but let's move on to the next guys recruiting guys are starting to make their official visits known nigel smith announced today officially that he will be taking an ov to six schools thanks to the ncaa passing that rule a few weeks ago where Starting July 1st, kids can take as many official visits as they would like, but schools can only host each prospect once for an official visit, unless there is a coaching change, which probably won't happen at this point, but you never know. So, Nigel Smith coming for Champion Barbecue, and then you've got four-star offensive lineman Marquise Easley coming the weekend before. Now, OU is doing a little bit of a different model this year. It seems like they're just really keeping it to they They want smaller groups, so they're not trying to do huge events, but when they have those big events, they want them to be memorable. It seems like Champy barbecue is going to do that for sure. We'll see if they for sure have the party in the palace again this year. I'm sure. It'll just all depend on when kids can schedule them out. Official visits are coming. I mean, 
it, it is recruiting time. What what do you think is in, in store here for OU in the next few months? Oh, um, exciting stuff. I'm excited to follow it, to talk about it on the, on, on the show. There's a lot of exciting things, obviously. June's going to be a big month. I, it's, it's been a slower start to the cycle than what we experienced last year. But I think as the summer progresses, as these OVs start to fill in, um, you know, obviously that's going to pick up. <clears throat> uh, with the two players that we're talking about right now specifically, um, I think it's huge for them to take OVs, and I think it'd be huge for you to land both of them. With Marquise Easley, the dude's a, fuck, a, a six, seven, 300-pound tackle who also plays basketball. He's got the stamp of approval from Alabama. Uh, I always rave about Bill Biedenboe. That dude, I think, with with a frame like that, Bill Biedenboe can do anything uh, with him, and then, then that's really exciting. I think he has, shoot, the next Trent Williams potential with just that size and athleticism, and, and Coach B at the – Reigns, if he does commit to OU, um, that would be awesome. I think with Nigel Smith, it's a guy we've talked about multiple times, a friend of the show he's been on. Uh, it, I think it's going to be a tough one. Like like we were ta- like we were talking about today over text, we had a buddy t- uh, ask us how we feel about Nigel Smith. I still feel pretty good about it. I've been saying it all along. I feel like Nigel Smith is ultimately going to be one of the p- four or five potential really, really good defensive linemen that will be a part of this class. Um, but as you mentioned, Ohio State and Penn State even are going to be some tough schools to beat out, and he does have officials lined up there. Um, I think he went to Ohio State spring game too. Uh, so he's he's been he's been around Ohio State a bunch. Uh, he's been around us a bunch. I think I don't know. I, th- I think at the end of the day, he's going to be part of the class, and the dude's a freak. Uh, so I mean, June's going to be so exciting. It's going to be a lot of fun for us on the show. It's going to be a lot of fun for us on Twitter. It's going to be it's going to be electric. It is definitely going to be huge over the summer. And Nigel Smith, I want to focus on him a little bit more because he has, as I mentioned, six official visits lined up as of right now. And he could add more if he really wanted to. Texas being his last one at the very beginning of September. I didn't check the date um, and compare it to the Texas football schedule. There's a chance that could be happening during a Texas home game. <clears throat> do you think that's a threat to Oklahoma and, and those other schools you mentioned in Ohio State and Penn State and trying to catch up? I think it's more of a, I can't really take an extra official visit until after July. And I want to, you know, maybe a family has vacation planned. There's always camps during the summertime where maybe that's also a conflict in schedule. Does Texas really have a shot here in your perspective from what you know and what what you're seeing here i think what sucks about it for ou and for everybody else interested in his services um the guy who had almost 20 tackles for a loss and 12 sacks last season uh, obviously a great player but what sucks about it is texas is getting the last uh ov they're going to be the freshest thing on his mind they're going to be what he last saw and i just looked it up his official visit with texas is slated for september 1st through the 3rd that weekend, that is when they they will be hosting Rice on the second. So he'll be at that game on the sideline likely. Um, and that's before Texas is going to fall apart or be good or whatever. So the crowd will be there. It'll be, I'm sure, a really, really cool environment for him to take in. Um, so that, I think, is always scary. It's always, you know, in recruiting, anytime we talk to anybody, we've always been, that's something we look at. It's who gets the last visit, who gets the last whatever. And, and for this case, it's, it's Texas. So that, I think... That's really the only thing about it that, to me, is frightening. Uh, just because the last visit means something, and that's going to be what's on his mind. And especially him taking in that first home game of the season, uh, the place is going to be rocking. Uh, so that's always scary. I think that could always change change the kid's mind. But I'm sticking to it. I think he'll be able to put all that aside, uh, have a fun weekend in, in Austin, but know that I think his football career will better take off in Norman. And I think, I, th- I still think we went out. But yes, I am a little bit afraid that they get the last visit, the last say, if you will. And I bet you're not the only one that has that similar thought because it is, it's a pretty common thing when you look around recruiting. Whoever gets the last visit, usually the team that ends up landing the player. One thing for Texas in this situation, though, is there's a huge gap between his last official visit in the summer, which I believe is in late June or early July, if you can double check me. And then he's they've got a whole month, month and a half before yeah. 
the Texas visit. His his A and M official is June twenty third through twenty fifth, and yeah, he has the whole month of July off and uh, August. Which yeah, is shoot him period. August, yeah. So you've got two months before his Texas visit. Can Texas hold off Penn State, Ohio State, or Oklahoma enough? And like here's, have enough value there for him. Here's another commit. Here's another thing that I think could be interesting in this. We talked to Joseph Jonah Johnny obviously on the show. He gave us a tentative uh, date that he wants to commit, and that's August first. So he'll be committed by this time. In theory, he should be. Guys like David Stone can be committed this time. Williams Noary, whatever. You know, if three or four of these guys that we're looking at, let's say they all commit in August or July or whatever it might be, and say, let's just say Stone and Ajanye and Williams Noary, just three, for instance, for this example, pick Oklahoma before that visit to Texas. I think that's something that could also factor into this decision. I think. Yeah, Texas having the last visit and all that is, is great for Texas, and that's it's a scary thought for everybody else. But if OU's landing these these dominant kids before that, we're getting commitments from really, really high-level kids. I think that's something that, at the end of the day, is more enticing than a home football game watching Texas and being their last visit. I think joining with guys like that will win out over Texas getting the last say. Yep, and he is going to be – like I said, there for the champion barbecue and two other guys in that position group. You just mentioned them. David Stone and Joseph Jonah Ajone are going to be there with him as well. So, I mean, if Oklahoma can find a way to leave the champion barbecue with the commitment of those three guys, that's a pretty successful weekend. I mean, yeah. obviously you would like more than those three or, you know, a variety. But those three, and let's just say you still have to wait another month before more come in i think ou fans will be happy with the with three guys those three guys being the uh june commitments you just got to get one of them first and i think it's going to be stone i think stone is the one that you really got to hit on just him being home him being at, on campus all the time anyway him a five star i think if you get david stone to commit in june or july uh it'll be like the first domino of many to fall it's just we got to get that first one could not agree more. And we don't want – we mentioned it a little bit at the beginning, but easily he's also going to be important. We'll see what happens there. He, it's unfortunate he's not going to be there for the champion barbecue. I think I saw that he's going to be actually at Tennessee during OU's champion barbecue, who another guy that is between Oklahoma and, and Tennessee is Williams Winery. And we're not, we won't talk about him too much, but definitely something that we're going to be checking in on with him. See if he's going to be taking a, the. Is he going to be at Tennessee for OU's Champion Barbecue weekend, or is he going to be in Norman with those other three guys? And then that weekend alone becomes that much more important because those are just defensive linemen that that will be there in attendance, and those are the four that OU seemingly has been in the lead for for a while now. Can they secure them? Who else will they be securing during that Champion Barbecue weekend? We'll definitely talk about it when that time comes but a lot of exciting things coming in the next mm-hmm. month buckle it, up stay tuned time that, yeah exactly um next thing like i mentioned at the top of the video we're just gonna look at the the defensive side of the ball who do we think starts at all positions all 11 we're gonna start with the defensive line we're gonna start in the trenches and move our way back Brandon, I'll hand the floor over to you. We can just you just go all four, the the starting four in your in your mind. Well, the defensive line is the richest position on the team. I think um, it's it's deep, it's real deep, especially with the additions of a Rondo Bothroyd with a Trace Ford, uh, guys who are proven on the field, proven success before. With Trace Ford, the big the big deal is obviously his injury pass. Hopefully, he can stay healthy, stay on the field. I think you start the season with both of those guys out there. It's going to be Bothroyd and Ford on the edge, uh, Jordan Kelly on the inside, and maybe Isaiah Kelly, the other inside guy. Maybe a, a Jacob Lacey, I don't know, uh, something there. But the D line, I think, is the hardest spot to, to project because I think maybe those four start the season, but I think it's going to be a lot of rotational play. And I don't know if you really solidify a true true blue starting four uh, until maybe week four or five of the season just because again that room is so so deep and so talented I think guys like R. Mason Thomas are going to take a big jump from from year one to, to this year uh, you know just being a little more experienced being a second year in the defense 
Uh, you look at a guy like Reggie Grimes. He's been there forever. Uh, maybe he can, you know, pick it up. Ethan Downs is still there. This room is loaded with talent, and it's so deep. Uh, so I'm picking those guys to start. I think Rondo Bothroyd will probably, he should at least be one of the guys on the end all season long. I think Jordan Kelly had a really, really big year last year. I think he's pretty safe too. And then you look at that other that other defensive tackle spot. I think Coe and Lacey, maybe even Kevin Gilliam, you know, switch switch around there. And on C, it's it's a it's a loaded room. Um, and then I think Trace Ford needs to start at the other end uh, of the line at least right away. But again, I think Armis and Thomas is going to be pushing for that spot. I think PJ Adebore could be pu- pushing for some playing time. Uh, it's deep, uh, but those are my I guess my initial four. Uh, but again, I think it's going to be very, very much a rotational base play, and I don't know if you have a true solidified starter along the front until week four or five. Yeah, I wonder how popular that unit of four is going to be that you just mentioned because you have essentially remodeled the the four. Like, there's no returning. There are returning guys from last year's starting group, but you didn't include Ethan Downs, like you mentioned. No Reggie Grimes. They got replaced by transfers. I don't think it's impossible because last year it's not like they had the best of outings or but great seasons. But. Was Jordan Kelly not a starter all season last year? I missed most of the year. He was starting by the or he, I think he started in the Florida State Bowl game that I watched. I believe you're right. I don't think he started all year. That might have been due to uh, opt-outs. But Jordan Kelly seems to be the winner of every offseason uh, workout. And it, it seems like it's just going to be a matter of time before he can step on the field and do what he does for all 12 games. Because last year, at leading up to the season, we were hearing a lot about Jordan Kelly. He was going to be one of the guys in the interior of the defensive line. Then he didn't get a lot of playing time for most of the season. He came in as a rotational guy, but he wasn't a consistent starter. <clears throat> so my four... I'm actually going to keep Ethan Downs on one side. I think he, even though he didn't put a ton of, he didn't get a lot of sacks, he was good at stopping the run. He wasn't, was he amazing at, you know, not getting distracted? It seemed like his eyes were in the wrong place sometimes, and he lost the ball. But we expect that to improve, just like we expect Danny Sussman to improve. So I'm going to pick Ethan Downs on one side. Interior, Isaiah Coe and Lacey. And then the other edge rush, edge spot, I'm going to go with Bothroyd. I think he's really good. He played well for uh, Wake Forest, was important to, to that team. But like you said, there's guys that you're going going in there and probably going to rotate a lot especially with situational stuff like third downs i don't think that those two at those two guys bothroyd and ethan downs are going to be your third down guys you're probably going to see our mason thomas there trace ford in there i don't think trace ford's going to be a guy that you're going to see starting it's he's probably going to be a uh, in passing situations just because he's really good at rushing the passer not that he's bad at stopping the run but you, he does have an injury history Maybe just to keep him healthy, you only put him out there, you know, third down, fourth down snaps when he when he's absolutely necessary, and keep him off the field on first and second. But that that's my projected starting lineup: Bothroyd, Downs on the edge, and Co. and Lacey in the middle. Uh, you're muted. Before we get attacked in, in the comment section, I wanted to talk about Joe Lawali real quick because I feel like a lot of people are going to have him projected as a starter, or at least a guy who plays heavily because coaches are talking really high on him. And I can see it. Uh, Joe Lawalu is a guy I just forgot to mention. Uh, kind of slipped my mind for a second. But Lawalu is another huge name to look out for on that, on that front, and I think he's going to get a good amount of playing time this season as well. And he did shift in the interior, which just gives him more opportunity because that's definitely the weaker spot. Like, if you just look at guys that are designated defensive linemen on the roster, I would agree with you. It is it's pretty deep. But when you start really looking at who can play on the inside and who's going to be more of an edge guy, the inside not as deep as you would like it to be. Maybe Grayson Halton gets some opportunities. That's a guy last year or part of the 2022 class didn't get to play a ton last year. Came in a couple times. I believe he did redshirt, so didn't come in for more than four games. Guy that can come in 
hopefully this year and, and be impactful. We haven't seen much out of Kelvin Gilliam, the name you mentioned. So. Eric LeBlanc, that, that room is so it's, – it's, I think it's the deepest spot. It's the deepest position on it, the team. There's potential, I would I would say. We just haven't seen that potential come to fruition quite yet. But who knows? Maybe the seasons, this is the season that that comes together, and it would be a great season for that to come together, given that we're going to the SEC for sure in 2024, now that all that has been taken care of by the universities and conference. Let's move to the next level, linebackers. Brandon, who do you got? Stutz and Koenig. I mean, that's it's obvious, but I think it's – I don't think there's. I don't think anything's shifting there. I, th- I think Danny Stetsman's going to have the best season statistically of the entire defense in terms of tackles, at least. I think. I think Danny Stetz is going to go for well over 100 tackles. I think he'll be been. He'll be in the backfield for seven or eight tackles for loss, maybe a sack or two. Uh, Danny Stetsman, I think, is prime for a big season. Uh, he was obviously I didn't get. To, I didn't get to watch much of last year, but looking at the numbers, he was all over the stat sheet. You guys talked about how him. How when he was out there, he was the 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 defense as a whole was better. He maybe he had a little bit of gassing issues from being on the field so much. Everybody on the defense, and I think he's going to be that leader of the defense. So really, um, it's going to be his defense. He's going to be like a Kenneth Murray type player this year. And I think Jaron Kank is the guy that we were all super, super excited about when he flipped from Oklahoma. Uh, it's it's his time too. I think you know, a big year, and I think behind them, you've got guys like Kobe McKenzie who are very capable. Kip Lewis who's very capable. Uh, you look at uh, God, the, the kid who just transferred from Paris State. His name was escaping me. Connor Near. Connor Near. Yeah, just a, a three time D two national champion. Bring some veteran presence. But at the, I mean, it, it's going to be Stutz and it's going to be Canick, with maybe a little bit of rotation. But I think those two are going to have big years, especially Danny Stutzman. I definitely agree with those two guys as the starters. And a guy that I definitely have been forgetting about who's already on campus and Phil Pachotti. He looked pretty good. When you look at pictures of him, he already looks massive. He looks the part. It just can he pick up the defense, the scheme quick enough to earn any uh, playing time. But the two starters seems like those. It would be a surprise if it's not Jaron Kanick and Danny Setsman at the linebacker positions. And then going ahead and just saying the cheetah, I think that one is – just as easy and Desan McCullough in my opinion I don't think there's any way that Justin Harrington gets a starting spot for the Cheetah even though it is still a competition McCullough just popped during the spring game and that's only three months into knowing this defense imagine what he's going to look like nine months into studying this defense and understanding where he's supposed to be and just playing instinctively and look at what he did as a freshman. And look what he did as a freshman at Indiana. I mean, the dude had six or so sacks. He was second team or first all Big Ten as a freshman. I think it was second team all Big Ten as a freshman. I mean, the dude is – yeah, no, I agree. I think Desan McCullough, of all of the newcomers to defense, and there's a bunch that I think are going to be really, really good, and Trace Ford, Bothroyd, Desan McCullough, Peyton Bowen, Reggie Pearson. Um, you know, there's five or six dudes on the defense that are new that I think are going to play a lot. Desan McCullough is going to be the best one of them, at least right away, I think. I agree 100%. And he's going to be a guy that's going to be there for at least one more year after the season. So a lot to be excited about with him. Uh, let's move on to the secondary. We'll just do all four guys. We won't split it between corners and safeties. Brandon, floor is yours. You can start wherever you want. So we've talked about it a bunch. I think Woody Washington is safe at one of the starting corner spots. The other one, it's going to be – we were talking about the defensive line being the, the deepest and richest part of the team. I think the corner spot's probably the weakest spot on the team. Um, not that there's not talent there, but I think it's just the one that I have the most um, questions about. Woody Washington's proven. I think a guy like Genji Williams probably would have been the front runner for the leading, have those health scares, and, you know, hopefully he bounces back and everything's good. He'll be able to go for season or whatever. You know, we, you, you, for his health, he's all good there. But that obviously set him back right now in this competition. Whatever, uh, can I Walker's a guy there that can be who Kendall Dolby might play at that corner. I don't really know the second corner yet, and that I think is going to be the biggest question. I think Josiah Wagner could end up being starting corner by by midseason with the way people are talking about him. Uh, which when was the last time OU had a freshman starting at corner? If if Josiah Wagner does end up a do we know? I think wasn't Bookie a freshman starter? 
he was he how was he nickel or say I don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe yeah, Bookie. But anyway, I think I think Josiah Wagner probably ends up being the starter just because there's there's room there for him to do it. At the safety spot, I think Reggie Pearson's locked into one, but I think he's going to be heavily rotating with a guy like Peyton Bowen because uh, Peyton Bowen's going to play a lot. He's going to get his. Um, that's I mean that right now I guess tentatively would would be mine. Pearson Bowen. Uh, with with Woody Washington and I think Josiah Wagner. I don't think Josiah Wagner starts right away. Maybe a guy like Kendall Dolby does uh, opposite him. Um, but I think by middle of the season, it's going to be Josiah Wagner out there. Do you think Peyton Bowen will be in over Billy Bowman? No, my bad. It's going to be Bowman with Pearson and, and Bowen rotating. Because I do think Bowen's going to get his. I agree. Especially when you're playing a team that might be more pass-heavy. Bowen seems to be the guy there instead of uh reggie and just because of his group ability in the return game someone that can track the ball and we saw what he can do in keeping up with his receiver in the spring game <clears throat> as long as he continues to develop i agree with him being heavily rotated i, I aligned with you with the safeties billy bowman and, and reggie corners i think it's going to be woody and kendall dolby Josiah Wagner, I agree, really been getting a lot of raving reviews over the last few months. He's just a freshman, and maybe it's going to be the just getting overpowered. Like, is that a possibility for him? I know he he, he compared himself to a 600-pound Siberian Tiger, so he plays strong. He likes He's stable, but it is a different level of football and especially when you're going up against bigger receivers it might be better to have a guy like kendall dolby or a can i walker out there who are just a little bit taller than josiah and give josiah an opportunity to develop um and looking at last year this is not a coaching staff where to learn where they would be okay with him learning on the job they rather him be prepared from the moment he steps on the field you're muted Maybe Jaden Rowe can finally get healthy. He's the guy that I raved about coming out of that class, and you know, due to injuries and stuff, and maybe other reasons, we have not seen him out on the field yet. Um, would love to see that still, uh, but who knows? Uh, I agree with what you're saying. I mean, I, I yeah, but the safety spot, just going real back to, I think I think Peyton Bowen and, and Billy Bowen play two similar of games, and that's why they both can't see the field at the same time or start at the same time because they're both. Whereas Reggie Pearson is more of an enforcing type safety, that dude's gonna lay the wood. Let I me mean, look what he did against us last year. As as no further evidence, I mean he blew up uh, Dylan Gabriel and he also blew up Eric Gray. Uh, you know, on, on real hard hitting plays. So that's why I think he edges Peyton Bowen right away, and Billy Bowen's always got that experience. But the corner spot's the most interesting spot on the team, and ho- I don't know. That that that's what I'll be mo- most looking forward to seeing play out on the defense. I'm with you there, but don't sleep on Billy Bowman being good at uh, stopping the run or run support because he's he's good at it. But Reggie Pearson does have that edge. I mean, thinking back to what he did to Dylan Gabriel, <laughs> now, it's nice thinking that he's going to do that too for us, not against us. Uh, yes. That's everything for today. Unless you have any final thoughts, or you just want to roll right into your end of video. Yeah, uh, this was a fun show. I, I, I like talking about projections and stuff like this as far as a, a whole defense will through the offense eventually soon, although I think that one's a little bit less um, complicated. I think that one's pretty more straightforward. Um, but anyway, so on the defense, I mentioned Desan McCullough and Hose, you agreed, as our newcomer of the year, if you will, on defense. But again, there's four or five, maybe even six dudes that are going to be brand new to this defense, whether a transfer portal edition or an incoming freshman such as Peyton Bowen that are going to be new faces on the on, on, on the defense, but all over the field, I think, playing a lot. So Hose and I picked us on McCullough as the newcomer year of the year on the defense. Um, do you guys agree, or who do you have? Of the new defensive players, again, whether it be freshmen or transfers, who is the most impactful in their very first season in the super defense? All right. You heard the man. Make sure to comment that down in the comment section. Like the video. Subscribe to the channel. Because it's like 60% of you guys that watched aren't subscribed. Just hit that subscribe button and share the video. We really appreciate when you do. Helps us grow a ton. Um, hopefully we can get to 7,000 subscribers by the end of the year. We'll see. That's a goal of ours. But we appreciate you guys for watching. We will see you on Friday. Maybe with Brum. Maybe not. We'll see.